What's up, my friends? Chad Kalick here. Before we get rolling on episode number 76, I'm super excited to tell you all about our Halloween special podcast series package, which you can access the announcement and pre-order page right now by clicking the link in the description box below. This package includes the 10-episode special podcast series called Fire in Disguise, in which for the first time ever, I'm going to share with you guys everything I know about James Gilliland's Assetti UFO Ranch, in which I have investigated that place three times. And trust me, you have seen less than the Cliff's Notes, if you've seen the UFO Ranch episode of Paranormal State. That place is fascinating, not only what happens above the sky, but at ground level and below. So if you're into UFOlogy and especially what's going on today, you don't want to miss this special podcast series. In addition, the Halloween package also includes a 10-episode podcast series on the ghost prophecies. I've said this many times, that investigation was life-changing. It was the only investigation that I was so freaked out that I actually drove 14 hours home rather than taking a two-hour flight. (laughs) There was a lot to that case that you guys don't know about because the episode got cut from 44 minutes to 22 minutes the day before it aired, so you missed a lot specifically about Yuraka Mesa, which is a Hopi Indian spiritual area that the entire St. James Hotel in the area sits upon. There's just so much to that case, and it will blow your mind, I promise you. If you're into the paranormal stuff and the ghost stuff, that case had it all, and it had my name written all over it, man. And you'll know what I mean when you hear the actual podcast about it. And if you buy both of those podcast series, The Fire in Disguise and The Ghost Prophecies, You will also receive, on Halloween, all three episodes of From Kentucky to Quincy, I Am Six, which is the full story of the I Am Six Part Two episode. A lot of people forget that that case actually started on another demonic case in Kentucky that was mind-bending. In fact, it was a demonic case in which one of the family members was actually reportedly murdered. But a lot of people forget about that case because the edit moved so quickly to Quincy. Now, there's a lot that went on in Quincy that you don't know about. There's a lot about the city that you don't know about. There's a lot about Laura Mooney's neighbors that you don't know about. There's just a lot to that case. And uh, like I said, if you get the Fire in Disguise and the Ghost Prophecies package on Halloween, you will receive all three episodes uh, from Kentucky to Quincy, I am six. So click the link in the description box below to check it out. And to all of the listeners of the AGH, The Devil in the Details, and the Blood Red Sky Notes from the Most Haunted Structure in the World special podcast series. Thank you all for subscribing as well. I'm having a blast telling these stories. I'm glad you guys are enjoying these so much. With that being said, let's get to episode number 76 of the In a Crowded Room podcast. What's up, everybody? Chad Kalick here, and welcome back to the In a Crowded Room podcast for episode number 76, which we're going to be talking about ancient astronaut theory. Now, why are we talking about this? To be honest, guys, most of my television watching comes at about 3, 4, 5 a.m., which is usually when I wrap up editing or just work in general and then I make myself a nice ice-cold Hawaiian punch, which is my cheat for the day, my sugar cheat. And I sit down, and there's just so many damn episodes of Ancient Aliens, and it seems like it's on, you know, six different channels, and uh, it always seems to come, you know, across my radar. And the thing about Ancient Astronaut Theory is, You know, guys, the first time I even heard about this, it made so much sense to me. And it brought back my initial thoughts about the Zapruder film and Kennedy. If you don't know what the Zapruder film is, which I assume we all do, that is the footage shot by Abraham Zapruder of the JFK assassination. Now, the first time I watched that footage, 
I could not believe that the narrative was that one person, Lee Harvey Oswald, shot and killed JFK because the footage itself, to me, the first time I watched it, I went, whoa, A, he shot from the front, B, there's multiple, you know, bullets firing, and, you know, and then they get Lee Harvey Oswald, and right away, Jack Ruby just walks out and shoots him in the gut, and the, just the whole thing just seems so screwy to me. Nothing about it made sense. But what made sense to me is that multiple people were involved, that this was a conspiracy. This made sense to me right away. That was my initial thought before anybody had to tell me anything about any conspiracy, it was like, well, wait a minute. I mean, if the president got killed, there would have to be multiple people involved. And uh, my point being is this episode isn't about JFK, but my point being is the first time I saw the footage and the first time I heard the theories involved and all that stuff, nothing made sense to me when it came down to the single person theory that it was just Lee Harvey Oswald and that was it. You know, we fast forward, you know, how many decades later and through analysis, through snitching, through documents being released, you know, you come to find out that, you know, yeah, this was in fact a conspiracy and, uh, you know, everybody from the vice president to, you know, the mob, Cubans, uh, you know, like there were so many people involved with this and you, you, know, you come to find out, yes, he was shot in the front. He was shot in the throat as well. There were, you know, multiple bullets firing from multiple directions. There were multiple eyewitnesses that, you know, saw the smoke over the grass, you know, all that stuff, you know, and you start going, well, yeah, now that makes sense now. And it's that gut feeling you had the first time you saw the footage that this was not one person behind all of this, right? Like you have that intuition that says, whoa, this doesn't make any sense. Now, the reason I bring that up is because the first time, you know, <laughs> I heard about the book of Genesis and creationism and the Big Bang and like all this stuff, I had that same feeling where I was like, man, I don't know. None of this strikes me as that's what happened. You know, now I know religion is man made. I'm not here to bag on religion because I think there's a lot of positives that that comes along with religion as well as negatives. But I'm just talking about from a factual standpoint, you know, it's kind of like the first time I heard the story of Jonah and the whale, you know, I obviously go, okay, that doesn't ring true to me. So when we try to figure out where did we come from, where did mankind come from? What is this rock that we're on? What is this blackness in the sky? You know, what are stars? What are, you know, like the, the unanswerable questions of life, right? The most obvious one being, you know, where did we come from, human beings? You know, the Big Bang only makes so much sense because you still go back and you could ride the Big Bang all the way back to before the bang. And you say, okay, well, what created that? This explosion that has the universe moving, you know, uh, expanding at a ridiculous speed. What created the stuff that exploded? And just so you guys know, that's why people, I never knew this until someone explained it to me. The reason that they believe in the Big Bang is because the universe appears to be expanding. Every, you know, we, our planet, all planets, galaxies, they are all supposedly moving at ridiculous speeds outward, and everything is moving outward. So if you trace it backwards, it all goes back to the middle, right? And this explosion, and that explosion would be the Big Bang. But none of that struck me as, you know, that, that natural intuition where you go, that's it, you know. Now, I know none of us have the answers to this stuff, okay? So I'm not, uh, there will be no, at no point in this podcast will I be like, are you all listening? I now have the answers to the universe. You know, I, I don't. But I can tell you this, growing up and hearing, you know, every different uh, religious 
theology from all my friends and they all had different ideas. And like I said, I did not grow up religious, uh, but I did go to college and I was, you know, just a few credits away from actually having a double major, having two degrees, my second being uh, in religious studies. You know, I was always fascinated with religion because I always wanted to know where did man come from? And not one of them. I've studied everything from Taoism to Sikhism to Zoroastrianism to Satanism to Buddhism to, you know, land-based religions to Nordic religions to Middle Eastern religions, obviously Christianity. And none of them, none of them gave me one answer that ever felt right or where my intuition said, hmm, there's something there, you know? Until I heard this concept and this idea that we are actually hybrids of another species, human beings, that we were created. I don't know why that naturally hit me as something that made sense. But for some reason, the concept that we were seated, that we were created here, for some purpose, made all kinds of sense to me. Now, a lot of it was because there's a lot of things with modern science that don't make any sense to me. Like they say that mankind is supposedly, the latest guesstimation is that we're 12,500 years old. And that's basically from just unearthing uh, different archaeological spots around the world and trying to figure out, you know, when did mankind exist as far as not only exist, but when did, when did, did language form? When did we have tools? When did we become industrialized? When did we start skinning animals and making fires and eating them? You know, things like when did we create the wheel? There was a time where archaeologists believed that mankind was 3,000 years old, and then it was 5,000 years old, and they said, no, it might be 6,000 years old. And then along comes this place called Gobekli Tepe in Turkey that just blows the lid off everything. And they discovered what they believe is only like 5% of this entire underground, you know, city that was basically buried. And it has all of these incredible monuments and these uh, in, in incredible stone carvings that have like laser precision, but there's no tools that have been found. There's no bodies that have been found. Uh, you know, they don't even know what the place was for. They don't know if Gobekli Tepe was for uh, religious ceremonies. They don't know if it was a burial site for, um, you know, worship. Uh, they, they know there's no bodies there, um, but it's absolutely fascinating. Please Google this, go Beckley Tepe. But that would put mankind at around 12,000 ish years old. Some people believe that go Beckley Tepe is actually older than that. Some say it's younger. But this is all kind of built around the belief that between 11 and 13,000 years ago, there was a great cataclysm that all but wiped mankind off the face of the earth. And a lot of archaeologists believe that basically three or four massive asteroids just ripped through our atmosphere and smashed our planet and created this almost instant decimation of mankind. Throwing the world into a super hot area where the explosion basically you know, took temperatures to uh, you know, ridiculous degrees. But then because of the impact and the devastation, it also took us from being an extremely hot planet to basically a forced immediate ice age due to what would be basically a nuclear winter. As a lot of people believe this is why uh, this is what happened to the city of Atlantis. Um, there's a lot of people believe that this is why there are cities that are being discovered underground, that there are pyramids in places in the ocean that shouldn't be there. Um, numerous lost cities have been found under the water. I mean, this is a fact. This isn't me, you know, guessing this. This is this happens. Uh, happens all the time. It's happened off the coast of Japan. Uh, just recently, off the coast of Cuba, they found uh, a pyramid 
underneath the water. There are full cities that nobody knows anything about that reside at the bottom of the ocean right now. So is mankind 12,500 years old? Or is that just the last basic cataclysm that wiped out this iteration of mankind? My honest belief is that we're probably, you know, a million, if not 500,000, 200,000 years old. I mean, who knows how long mankind, you know, has existed on this planet. But there are some things that make me believe the ancient astronaut theory is probably the closest thing we have to the truth. If you look at all the pyramids that are, you know, around the world from, you know, South America, you know, all the way over to China, to Egypt, uh, they're, they're everywhere. Croatia, they, they recently found one. At the same time, if you look at a lot of the monolithic sites, the uh, Gobekli Tepes, you know, these, these places where, you know, 200 ton stones have been carved in exact precision. You know, places like Machu Picchu, places that are at ridiculous altitudes, you know, 14,000, 16,000 feet. And they're built out of these stones that come, come from nowhere native. You know, and these, these locations are all over the world like this. And whether you're talking about monolithic sites or pyramids, they all have similarities when it comes to their actual building block mechanisms. And, you know, like Machu Picchu and Gobekli Tepe, they both have these like little, they look like T's, like, like the letter T. And they don't know what the tool was, but were all these, you know, massively heavy stones, you know, are placed together where you can't even slide a, a, a piece of paper in between them. These rocks are so tight. They do find these carvings where these T, it looks like a T. So they think it had something to do with how they were moved or how they were tightened, but th these little tea carvings and these massive stones, they appear all over the world. So it appears as though the same species, I guess, of human being was seemingly teaching this at the same time. That there were teachers at one point around the world that were teaching the different uh, people of different regions how to do this. So you basically get, you know, a pyramid in Peru and a pyramid in Egypt, while the decor may be different. You know, the methods in which they were created, even though we can't determine how they created them, we can see details of creation. And they're all the same. And then you look through the artwork around the world. From here in the U.S. to, again, South America, Turkey, Egypt. I mean, there's all these bizarre paintings and carvings that appear to be Flying saucers, airplanes, helicopters, you know, objects in the sky coming from, quote, the heavens. That's all over the world. These carvings and paintings, they're all over the world, the same thing. You know, you look at the Nazca lines, that's in Nazca, Peru, where they don't know how they did it or why they did it, but there's just hundreds of of these, you know, uh, giant paintings where they basically took the top layer of rock off to reveal a brighter layer of rock below, and it creates these pictures to the skies, to the heavens. Problem is, no one flew back then, obviously, so who were they contacting? The first time I heard about all of this stuff and, you know, started plugging, you know, all the different fascinating elements of ancient astronaut theory in beyond the overwhelming amount of evidence to suggest that we were seated, that we were created, 
there was just that gut feeling that this is right. Something that, you know, I, I don't have the details. I don't have the science to prove it or anything. But it was just like, there's just something about this that makes so much sense to me. Especially the gap between mankind and every other species on this planet. It, it, it really does seem as though we don't belong to planet Earth. Let's start with the fact that every other creature on planet Earth reveres planet Earth as something special, where we have no problem just destroying the shit out of this planet. We have no problem with it. None whatsoever. You know? There was something that occurred several years ago, and it blew me away when I heard this. Uh, when that last major tsunami occurred and it just decimated Phuket, Thailand and killed like 150,000 people. What blew my mind is, did you guys hear how many animals were lost during the tsunami in Phuket, Thailand? Like, did you guys hear how many animals, like natural animals, monkeys, um, you know, just the wildlife of the area. Did you hear how many were lost? Zero. Zero. When the waters receded, all of the natural wildlife knew exactly what was going on. They were already heading for, <laughs> you know, higher ground. They knew what to do. I mean, you know, they were connected to the earth. But 100, you know, 15,000 people that are supposedly have intelligence that far exceeds, you know, these, these quote, stupid animals were killed. They couldn't survive it. I remember thinking, well, you know why? Because we have no connection to <laughs> this planet that we're on. We can't read it, feel it, anything. We have to create computers to do that for us. We have to create sonars. We have to create all that stuff. But yet the, the animals that are native to this planet, they could read it. They could feel it. You know, so it really does feel as though we were put here, especially when you start looking at, you know, Egypt, I think, is the big giveaway to all of it. I think, uh, you know, if you look at a lot of the old Egyptian, um, what many believe are the Anunnaki skeletons and the elongated heads and the seven to eight foot skeletal structures, those skeletons clearly do not appear to be what we would, you know, say to be, you know, your standard human. There was something obviously very unique that happened in Egypt that was documented very well. And today we don't know what a lot of that is. You know, we could read what they wrote. But when it comes to their understanding of astronomy and just... It's just fascinating. It's fascinating the mathematical precision and the attention to detail when it comes to the sky. It's just always made sense to me that we are not, you know, from here, that we were brought here or created. And I know a lot of skeptics would say, well, if they were created, if we were created by this alien race, where is this alien race today? Well, we don't know what we could or could not have been created for. And I'm, I, I couldn't even begin to guess, but what if we were actually created to mine uh, this planet for natural resources? What if we were a million years ago and what you have is the continuation of a species that keeps existing in a new iteration every time there's some massive global event that happens that wipes out the majority of the population. 
I mean, if we were in fact created by an alien race, there's all kinds of reasons why they would want to just watch us from a distance. You know, there's almost no gain by just destroying us. You know, what if we evolved into something? What if we were created with the alien basic, you know, the basic alien DNA with chimpanzees, for example? You know, what if the evolution of that species could create something that could help the original species, the alien DNA? We don't know that. You know, we do that in science now all the time. You know, they're splicing DNA and genes and all kinds of stuff. And they're, you know, watching and doing tests and doing all kinds of stuff to see if this new creation could actually benefit the original creation, us, human beings, and make us stronger. So there's all kinds of reasons to just view from that standpoint. From a social structure, there's all, man, there's every reason in the world to just watch and stay away. I mean, did you hear the story about these... Uh, this tribe that was in the middle of nowhere, um, out near, it was near the Bikini Atoll Islands, and they had never seen, you know, you know, basically white man. They had never seen white man. And one time period, this guy showed up and he wanted to basically spread Christianity. And he showed up and he had disease, and everybody in the tribe got sick, and they just viewed him as like a monster. And he barely escaped the island and got away. Well, you know, like 50, 60 years had passed and this legend of this white devil that brought this sickness with him had spread throughout, you know, the tribe. So just recently, like last year, the year before, some, you know, new dumbass shows up with his Bible and decides he wants to go convert them and show them the way and they shoot him with arrows and they kill him and then they eat him. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? Like, if I come across a new tribe, um, or if I created a new species and they had never seen me before, the most dangerous thing I can do is land and just stick out my hand and go, hello, how you doing? Dangerous to them and dangerous to me. So if an ancient alien species created us, and we're a million years into the uh, you know, the 300th iteration of who we are, you know, whatever human beings are. They have every reason to watch us, to test and develop the DNA and to see the advancements that have happened. They have every reason to study us, to see what did their original DNA uh, code, this new creation, mankind, what are the benefits you know, what are the benefits of potentially, say, taking the, you know, alien DNA and merging it with chimpanzee? You know, chimpanzees, the, the, their problems, if you look at chimps, they're too emotional. They're just highly, highly, highly emotional. And if you look at human beings, you know, what's one of our biggest problems is that we're highly emotional. You know, so I wonder if aliens like lack... You know, if, if, if there was an alien race that created us, I wonder if they lack that emotion. If they're almost like Spock, you know, they just work on pure rationale. You know, now I know I'm just, guys, I'm spitballing here. You know, my mind is just wandering. But there is something about ancient astronaut theory that rings true to me. There's something about it that really, really rings true to me. Especially when... You know, you stop and think about the whole concept of, uh, you know, they could never reach us. I always hear this all the time. You know, there's so many species out there in the galaxy. There has to be in the universe. There has to be millions of species in the universe. But they always say, but the problem is, you know, how would they ever find us? Well, first off, if we're talking about an infinite galaxy, I'm sorry, an infinite universe, then we're talking about an infinite number of species. Then we're talking about infinite searches to find, you know, us. I mean, to me, it's, if you're going to say that because the universe is infinite, it only makes sense that there's life out there. Well, the same probability as there being life out there would be that they would find us or that they already know we're here because they made us. They made us. 
And that also makes total sense where if they made us, it totally makes sense that somewhere on this planet there's some outpost, some place where the original species is watching over. Because what you don't want to do is have your creation run wild and start doing things that would ultimately end you, right? Like, what if you had a child and tomorrow you're like, man, he's so smart. Look at how smart he is. And, you know, in a couple of years from now, you go down to your child's bedroom and he has a nuclear bomb sitting down there. You know, you're going to oversee that. You're going to go, whoa. And you're going to either take that nuclear bomb away. You're going to disarm it. And if you can't, what you're not going to do is allow that child to have the ability to just destroy and kill tons of people. So there's all kinds of reasons if they made us, knowing the potentials that could come, the potential positive things. You also have to weigh the potential negative things. And the only way to do that is to have somebody basically watching, reviewing, and protecting over time, over a very long period of time, which means there would have to be some kind of outpost and some kind of base and the bottom line is, we don't know what is under all that damn ice. I'm talking about Antarctica. We don't know. We know that there's all kinds of weird, bizarre readings that are coming out of Antarctica. We know that the few people that have actually traveled deep into Antarctica have reported nothing but high strangeness. There's something going on. And I guess I just wanted to do this episode because I wanted to know how do you guys feel. For those of you who haven't dug into ancient astronaut theory, please do because it's fascinating. And for those of you who have, my question is real simple. Does it make sense to you? And did it ring true right away that there's something to that? Now, again, I don't have the answers and I don't want to pretend that I do. It just made sense the first time. I dug into it. It made sense. The first time I heard about it, it made sense. It just struck me as true. And I think in nature, we have that about us. We have things that, uh, that are like that sixth sense almost, right? They talk about just things that make sense. So I would love to know your thoughts. Let me know in the comments what you guys think. And just a quick reminder, please click the link in the description box to check out the Halloween special podcast series package, which I mentioned at the beginning of this episode. Thank you all for listening once again. Much love, and I will be back tomorrow with more. All the best.